and verse 1. This scripture needs to be cried aloud the day that we're living in. Here in McDowell County, across North Carolina, across the United States, and all over the world. And especially here in the United States, I suppose, where people need to learn what this verse of scripture teaches. I have, after much prayer and thought, decided to bring this message this morning. And I'd like to ask you to listen carefully, listen prayerfully, because everything I say, by the help of the Lord, is to be important. I want to ask the kids, if you will, to be real still and be real quiet and don't have any unnecessary moving around uh, while we try to preach the Word of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, the Bible says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Let's read that verse again. Every man, woman, boy, girl in the building, let's read that verse. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I want to speak to you on the subject this morning. We chose for a title of this message, Devil's Juice, or Public Enemy Number One. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for another blessed privilege that we have, Lord, to stand behind the sacred desk, proclaim your precious word. We know your eye is on the sparrow, and we know you watch us today. And our fathers, we come before you this morning. We ask you for help. We ask you for strength. We ask you for uh, spiritual insight. God, we pray for illumination of our minds. Lord, that you would help us to declare thy word without fear or favor this morning. I ask you, dear God, to anoint every word we're about to say with power in the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I pray that it will not just be with men's wisdom and enticing word, but with demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. Do with us and for us and through us what needs to be done in this place today. And we'll bow our heads and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. I want you to hold your horses there just a second. Hold your seats real good and tight. And uh, pray for us today as we bring you the message on devil's juice. And the Bible said, of course, tells us what this devil's juice is. It's wine and it's strong drink. Liquor... Beer, wine, whiskey, uh, shaving lotion, anything else that would fit into that category of strong drink. And we're going to try to preach to you this morning with all the sincerity that we have in our soul. For the Bible says that it's a mocker and it is raging. I believe this morning that it's public enemy number one. The greatest enemy that we have to the public this morning is strong drink. And I want to try to prove that to you in, during this message. Now, you might not... I don't want you to think like one man I heard who, who drank quite a bit, and the preacher told him that drink was his enemy. And he said, well, preacher, the Lord said love our enemies. And the preacher told him, he said, yeah, but the Lord didn't say swallow them. And he began to talk to this man and told him that this is not the kind of enemy that the Lord told you to love. This is the kind of enemy that you are to hate and detest and despise. And so this morning we're going to be talking about it being public enemy number one. I believe, first of all, this morning that it's public enemy number one because of what it does to our homes. Nearly every home in this church, I'd say every person in this room this morning, has seen, has had your home affected by the wrong misuse of alcoholic beverages. And many homes this morning have completely been destroyed because of strong drink. Do you realize this morning that nearly 300,000 young men this year will have to start drinking in order to fill the shoes of 300,000 drunks that get killed in this following year? And that means to take the place, and there'll probably be a lot more than that, but 300,000 young men, and maybe some of the young men in this church today, will someday take up the habit and the sin of drinking. And brother, it may be some of our sons that may fill the shoes of these men who have got killed and died drunk. Which of your boys do you intend 
shall stand in the footprints of ruined men. I want to say this morning, it's an enemy of our homes. Illustration number one, down in South Carolina, not, not long ago or too many years back, a young cotton mill worker, a young, strong, healthy man, had a good job at the cotton mill. He had a sweet wife and a darling little baby. One Saturday morning, he was off work. And so he went downtown. And went downtown and went by the pool room and went by a few places at the carnival and had a few drinks. He had some beer and then later on some liquor. He come home staggering up the, up the street that evening uh, drunk. And his wife and the neighbor and had a little baby in her arms was sitting out on the front porch. And when she saw him staggering up the drive, driveway, she told her neighbor she, she had better leave because when he got like that, he'd start trouble. And so the neighbor hurriedly down the steps and ran over to her house. The man comes up and a drunken stupor and a drunken rage begin to uh, cuss and fuss about dinner not being ready. And the wife said, Honey, I didn't know you was coming home. I didn't expect you for a while. And he just ranting and a raving. And he took a swing at his wife. She ran in the house scared with her little baby in her arm. He ran into the house and following after her, picked up a piece of stove wood and slung it at his wife and hit her, knocked the little baby down to the floor. And all in a demon, demonic, terrified, drunken rage, ran over and got the little baby and picked it up and took a butcher knife and sawed its head off. And its body fell to the floor. And he was standing there with the little baby's uh, hand in his uh, head, in his hand. And brother, the, the man that witnessed this later said that he saw that man's fingerprint all over the head of that little baby. And the mother was absolutely terrified stiff, run outside screaming and hollering. And there stood the man with his baby's head in his hand and his body laying on the floor and blood running all over this man. And uh, he, they told him about it the next day and when he was in jail arrested for murder in the first degree after he sobered up he said I can't believe what I've done I killed my baby and he said my God my God what have I done I believe this morning that every person that votes for beer and liquor and wine and every person that puts their approval on it ought to have to stand there and look at that little headless baby laying on the floor her daddy standing there with the blood. It's our enemy this morning, folks. It'll never do us no good. Never has done anybody any good. I know on television they glamorize it. And a bunch of nuts on commercials put it on there and act like, oh, it's a And even at the football games, you know, they have contests. See who drinks the most kind of different kind of beer at the Super Bowl. I want to say, brother, why don't they publish a picture of that little baby's body laying there? Why don't they tell the truth, a bunch of hypocrites. Amen. Illustration number two. A 12-year-old boy came home one afternoon in a small uh, mountain village. He saw his daddy drunk, grabbed a hold of his mama, trying to choke her to death. Scared to kill his mama, the little boy got down his daddy's shotgun that he saw his daddy use so many times before. He pulled both barrels of a double barrel shotgun right down on the back of his daddy's head and blowed his brains out. And his daddy lay there on the floor dead. All of these are true stories. I'm talking about the enemy of our home. And his daddy lay him there dead, died drunk. What kind of a life will that little boy grow up? Growing up knowing that he murdered his own dad. Had to kill him to save the life of his mother. Why don't they publish that and put it on a billboard? Why don't they tell you that when they say we're going to have a vote? I want you to know this morning that it's our enemy of our home. Illustration number three. A man had been drunk several days. He come home, started to fuss with his family, picked up his baby, threw it out the window, right through the glass of the window. It was all the mother could stand. She couldn't stand it. She had put up with that stuff for years. She grabbed his pistol and began to fire a pistol at her, at her own husband. She fired six times. All six bullets found their mark and another man uh, sunk to his feet and died an alcoholic and died drunk. Brother, she saw him and he sank to the floor. Illustration number four. A businessman. A well-known, prominent, successful 
successful businessman, drank heavily all of his life. Finally, it caught up with him and took its toll. And brother, as he died in delirium tremens, shaking and going into DTs, as he died, the nurse said, I never want to see another man die drunk. She said as he began to die, he screamed and his bed was full of snakes. And he said, these snakes all over me, all over my body, all over my bed. And then he said, the devil was getting him and dragging him out. His eyes turned green. His face was pale. And he began to scream and holler. And brother, he stepped out into eternity. And brother, do you realize there went another and died drunk. I'm going to mention you this morning. It is an enemy of our homes. Do you realize this morning, most of the time, if a man of the house drinks, the kids will drink. I know a lot of girls that said, I'm married and I'm getting away from this. Daddy stays drunk all the time. I'm going to go off and I'm going to marry somebody that's, that'll take care of me. Nine times out of ten, they'll marry somebody that drinks as bad as their daddy did. It falls and it falls under the third and fourth generation. The curse of liquor and beer and wine. This young, uh, I remember reading about a, a man, a young man, his daddy was an important general. And at a well high society party, one of the highfalutin ladies come over to him and she said, Mr. General, I noticed that you're not drinking any wine. And he said, No, ma'am, I never touch the stuff. I'm teetotaling. And she said, Well, it seemed like a man of your importance and a man of your position would surely, uh, it wouldn't hurt to take just a little sip. And he said, Well, it might not, just one little sip. But he said, You see that boy sitting right over there? And she said, yeah. He said, that is my son. And he said, if I drink, I take the wine glass, more than likely he will too. You've noticed that when they passed it around, he turned it down, don't you? And she said, yes, I did. He said, that, my friend, is why I won't touch the stuff. I want you to know, my dear friend, it is the enemy of our home. How many homes do you think there were in McDowell County just last night whose mother sat there and waved and worried and worried where the bill money was coming from, where they was going to get any groceries this week. And the mother was scared. And brother said, Honey, here comes Daddy. Here comes Daddy. And man heard his Daddy coming up the steps of cussing. And the little kids had to go and hide under the bed where Daddy would beat them. How many places do you think that happened last night right here in Maine, North Carolina? It's an enemy of our homes. How many times you ever seen a little baby cry because it's scared? Daddy's going to hurt Mama. You ever seen that? You ever seen the tears that come down little baby's face and them crying and scream? No, Daddy, no! Don't hurt Mama. I tell you, it happens because of the enemy of our home. I know that you know, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's our enemy to individuals in our home. They come out with a song not long ago that said, Don't let the good life pass you by. And one of the words in the lines in that song said, Have you ever seen the funny side of booze? And they say it's funny. You ever notice how teenagers get drunk and they think it's funny? They will laugh about it. And they come to school and just laugh and laugh and laugh. Oh boy, we got drunk. You see him. He is so drunk he passed out. And boy, that's real funny. And they said, have you ever seen the funny side of boozing? But all of a sudden, illustration number five. Crash. Bang. There's an accident at the corner. There's a little girl been hit by a car. She's laying there in front of the car. The driver staggers out, slobbering all over himself. And a drunk empty liquor bottle falls out of the car, busts all over the highway. And he looks down, and an ambulance and sirens come screaming into the community. They put the little girl, take her into the hospital, and she come to find out she lived, but she's crippled for the rest of her life. Isn't that me? Just laugh. I could laugh all day about that, couldn't you? That's so funny. Some of you teenagers get out and get drunk. You wait till something like that happens to you, and you have to live with that the rest of your life. You won't laugh then. Illustration number six. Mother and children sit and look out the window. And they look and look and look and look. And Daddy's been off for about four hours now. And it's payday. And Daddy ain't come home yet. 
And they sat and they looked. And they sat and they looked. And they sat and they looked. And the kids said, Mama, I'm hungry. Oh, we're going to get any groceries today. In the day of the day, you said we'd get groceries. And she said, Honey, just as soon as Daddy gets here, we'll go get groceries. And finally, Daddy staggers in and stopped by the local joint on the way home and gambled all his paycheck away and drunk it all up. And a kid has to go without another few days. Isn't that funny? Illustration number six. Seen in an average hospital. Young woman in there screaming of her mind. Going into DT screaming. Don't even know her name. Isn't that hilarious? That's funny, ain't it, folks? Brainson's laughing. Because the deep tooth of alcohol, liquor, and beer, and wine grips our hearts. We know what kind of devil juice enemy is. You know, they say, first of all, the man takes a drink. After that, the drink takes a drink. And after that, the drink takes the man. I heard an old something. It's kind of, I want to kind of mix in a little bit of this so I won't make you sick a whole message. Mix in some parts you can enjoy. Old drunk said one time, when I say this, I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm just trying by the grace of God to show you how terrible it is to drink that stuff and, and mess with that stuff and try to help you the best I can. You ever seen us that's drunk a whole lot? Here's what he said. When they said brains, I thought they said trains, and I missed mine. When they give looks, I thought they said books, and I said, I don't want any. When they passed out noses, I thought they said roses, and I sent me a big red one. And when they give out chin, I thought they said gin, and I said, make mine a double. He said, look at what alcohol, oh boy, am I a mess. Look at what it's done to me. Think of how many have been ruined. It makes them lose all of their self-respect. It's an individual's enemy. The young girl no more. Her eyes are not bright like they used to be. They're red and sunken in her head. Her hair is not beautiful and shiny anymore. It's stringy and dirty and out of place. Her beautiful lips don't produce smiles anymore, but blasphemy, cursing, filthy oaths, and threats. That turn what alcohol can do to an individual. You ever seen what alcohol can do to a man? It can take a good, hard, clean, fine, hard-working man and turn him into a spewing, spittering, sputtering, slobbering, staggering, stammering, stringy-headed, bleary-eyed, red-faced, raving, craving, drunk. That's what it'll do to a man. You ever notice what alcohol does to our morals? Number two this morning, it's public enemy number one because of what it does to our morals. Many have been ruined through drink. There's been a many a young teenage girl done something before she come home at night that she'd have never done had she not been under the influence of strong drink. Lost her virtue and lost that God had given her that'll never be given back because of strong drink. I tell you, let me tell you young teenage girl something. Why in the world do you think boys tries to get you to drink? Do you think they enjoy spending their money? Are you kidding me? You know why a boy gets you drunk? Because he knows when you get drunk, you don't care, you don't have no respect for yourself, and you'll just let him use you like a dog and just treat you any way that he wants to do you. That's why he tries to get you drunk. That's why he says, I'll buy you anything you want to drink. Because he knows what it'll do to your morals. What will it do to a man's morals? The Bible said it'll make you behold strange women and get in fights. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says strong drink will make you go looking at women you ain't supposed to look at, and it'll make you get in fights. You want to find out if the Bible's true? Just look around. You know, nobody, nobody likes to be around a drunk. That's true. Nobody likes to be around a drunk. I mean, brother, they just ain't got nobody that really likes to be around them. They don't even like to be around each other. They, 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 drinking or wind a man up in the gutter. 
Have you ever seen anything but pigs and drunks in the gutter? Now, I'm serious. Amen. I'm serious this morning. Listen to this. One evening in October, when I was far from sober and dragging home a load with manly pride, my feet began to stutter, so I lay down in the gutter, and a pig came up right by my side. Then I said, It's fair weather when good fellows get together, till a lady passing by was heard to say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company that he chooses. And the pig got up and slowly walked away. I want to say that even a pig won't even have... Did you know a goat won't drink liquor? Did you know a goat will eat... It? Man, eat anything. Goat eat drink some pretty nasty stuff, folks. But it won't drink liquor. You know what beer smells like? Hog slop. It, it smells a whole lot like slop for the hogs. And a man is, he says, i got to make money. They're going to drink it anyway. I'm going to sell it. I agree with old Oliver B. Green where he said, I would rather slop hogs for a living than sell booze. Amen. Amen. Public enemy number one because of what it does to our highway. It's public enemy number one, folks, because of what it does on our highways. I'll prove what I'm saying. There's no two ways about it. The police in North Carolina tell you, and the police commissioners will tell you, that their number one priority, the number one thing that police are concerned about, the number one thing that people are, uh, or the law enforcement is working on, is drinking and driving. They tell us that 55% of the highway fatalities occur on weekends and 55% of them are due to drinking. In other words, 55 out of 100 people that get killed on the highway are killed because somebody was drinking. That means if you lined up 100 people up here, then coffins that are dead and gone, and you lined 100 of them across the front of this church, then you could raise up 55 of them, and 55 of them would still be alive if it were not for drinking. That's over half of all people that get killed on the highway are killed because of drinking. That means if you got 200, that means 110 of them would still be alive. They'd still be a daddy. They'd still be a wife that has her husband. They'd still be a boy or girl that has a dad or a mom. They'd still be a mom or dad that has a baby if it were not for drinking. In a recent government study, they tell us that one... Listen, folks. They tell us that one out of every ten vehicles you meet in North Carolina on the highway on the weekend is drunk. And by that I mean they have their point level of alcohol is up above that point ten mark. And they are legally drunk. Unable to have complete control over their actions. On the weekends, one out of every ten cars you meet on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is drunk on the average. Now you tell me, brother, it ain't nothing but God's grace keeps us alive from week to week and year to year. Because the very car you meet on your way home this evening may be somebody just getting over a big one from last night and just say, oh, I've lost everything I've got. I can't pay my bills. I'm losing my wife. And I'm losing. I believe I'll just hit this next car head on. Bam. And it's liable to be you. One out of every ten. Can you imagine a highway like 221 going up through here towards Boone on the weekend where them cars are just weird past each other? Can you imagine how many drunks you pass up through there? On the average weekend, you folks up at work up there and up in that part of the uh, the county and territory, you realize it's God keeping you alive every weekend, every week for that. Hundred and sixty one million dollars a year spent just on cause of hauling in wrecked cars and stuff like that on account of drunk people. It's public enemy number one because of what else to our money. It's our enemy, folks. It's robbing us because of what it does to our money. It takes it up. Many a kid has done without because of strong drink. It takes the shoes off the baby's feet 
clothes off mom the children's back, fuel out of the stove, milk out of the icebox, and take the quilts off the bed, candy right out of the baby's mouth. And I'll tell you these lying, hypocritical fakes going around telling you that we need beer and wine because we're going to make money and make revenue and North Carolina makes all this revenue. They're a lying bunch. Buddy. And it's going to be on the radio too pretty soon. And thousands are going to hear it. They're a lying bunch of devils. According to the statistics. According to statistics that are released by the uh, cost of North Carolina and its citizens. I just want to read them to you for a couple of years back. First of all, I'm going to give you in North Carolina all the total revenue that we made off liquor, beer, and wine. Tax, which is 12% state tax on whiskey, we got $37,183,736. Tax on beer and wine, $9,240,546. Tax on beer sales, Thirty-seven million one hundred seventy-four thousand nine hundred dollars. Tax on wine sales four million nine hundred one thousand seven hundred forty-eight dollars. Profits from ABC stores twenty-six million one hundred thirty-four thousand three hundred forty-six dollars. And license fees and so on, so people can get license to sell you liquor one million two hundred sixty-four thousand seven hundred twenty-one dollars. Total all the money that North Carolina made about two years back off of liquor, beer, and wine one hundred sixteen million dollars. And brother, you go look at the other side of the picture. Let's look at what it costs North Carolina to have liquor, beer, and wine. And don't you let these bunch tell you that we're going to get all of this money and we're going to have all this revenue and all of these things. Call to North Carolina and its, and its citizens. Purchase of the whiskey, right out in money, $210 million. Beer, $208 million. Wine, $23 million. Motor vehicle accidents because of it. One hundred sixty one million thirty two thousand seven hundred and sixty dollars. It cost them over $160 million to haul in the wrecked cars and cause the ambulances and the EMS and the, the policemen had to be paid to go out and investigate because of somebody driving drunk. Criminal justice system, $12,740,260. That means all the court cases. Do you realize, folks, tomorrow morning, if they have it, when they have court up here at McDowell County uh, Courthouse, that judge that comes in there and sits all day, and them lawyers that get up there and talk, they ain't doing that for their health. Man, they're getting paid for that. Them judges get paid for that, folks. And it cost us $12 million in one year to pay them sitting there trying the drugs. I've been up to the courthouse before and just sat there and just took kind of a little survey. And if there's ten men to be tried, if you don't believe it, you can go up there, go up there any day you want to and check it for yourself. If there's ten cases to be tried, at least seven or usually sometimes eight are because of driving drunk or something had to do with drinking. Now that means we could eliminate nearly 80% of all that court cost and all that stuff if it wasn't for drinking. Save ten, probably eight or nine, ten million dollars just in that one area right there. Health and medical has to put bandages on them and get them out of fights and take them to the hospital and, and pay for them because they, they ain't got a job and won't pay for themselves and have to take them to the uh, place the hospital and help them keep them up and do all these things and pay their family something while they're there. Two hundred seven million dollars, three hundred fifty-one thousand six hundred. Treatment of chronic alcoholics, AA, Anonymous, and uh, up in Black Mountain and Broughton and places, $15,989,800. Lost production. They don't ever tell you about that, do they? You know how much money North Carolina lost in one year because people couldn't show up to work drunk? $233 million. Social welfare welfare programs to keep up the drunk's family, 
$3,455,860. Total of what it cost North Carolina for drinking, $1,076,338,000. As opposed to making $116 million, almost ten times as much. live. And the bloodsucker said, listen, Mr. Mew, I'm going to make a deal with you. If you'll let me suck ten drops of blood out of you, I'll give you back one drop. And Mew said, well, I'm going to still be getting some. That sounds all right to me. And the bloodsucker went to work. He sucked out ten, give him back one. I tell you what I'll do. I'll trade with you all day like that. Yeah. I'll give you a dollar and you give me ten, okay? I'll trade with you all day long. But I tell you honestly, folks, what I said about remarkably crooked, that's what, that's what most people's problem are. Because they know that them individually, they're going to get their pocketbook fat. And they don't care how much me and you and all the regular citizen taxpayers have to pay for that stuff. It's a few individuals that's racking in the money and making it. And there's where the problem comes from. And they're going to say, oh, we're going to have all this money in man. We're going to build new parks for the kids. We're going to do that. We're going to do oh, a bunch of baloney. I tell you what we'll do. We'll just have more hell than we got now. I want to say to you this morning that it's our enemy because of what it does to our money. You know, I heard a story one time about a father Come up on, uh, heard about a wreck across town. He went across, there's five teenagers dead in the accident. Later, when they brought them out and dragged the bodies out and identified them, one of them was his daughter. Y'all listening? One of them was his daughter, his flesh and blood daughter that he saw grow up and from the little girl and saw her walk to school and brother had memories of her. She's dead in an alcoholic drunken wreck. Liquor bottles all around there and broke and whiskey on all of their breaths. Her daddy seen that and he was a strong man. He said, I'll kill the man that give her that liquor. Daddy went home he was going out of his mind nearly in worry and torment. Went over to his bar he had in his home. And on the bar he found a note. And it said, Dad, we borrowed some of your liquor. I knew you wouldn't mind. And that man had to live with that the rest of his life. His own liquor killed his daughter. I want to say if you vote for beer, if you vote for wine, one of these days you'll have that on your conscience. Someday your child may be laying out there on the highway with his blood and guts splattered all over the place. Don't give me that stuff about when... I tell you folks, if it made us a million dollars a year, we wouldn't need it. If it made everybody and men a million dollars a year, we'd be better off with that. I don't want to see my little beautiful blonde-headed girl that God gave me splattered and ruined and killed and ruined by drink. I don't know about you. I need and want money that bad. You ever notice what a bar is? A bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. A bar to manliness and wealth. A door to want and broken health. A bar to honor, pride, and fame. A door to grief and sin and shame. A bar to hope. A bar to prayer. A door to darkness and despair. A bar to honor, useful life. A door to a brawling sense strife. A bar to all that's true and brave. A door to every drunkard's grave. A bar to joys that home and parts. A door to tears and aching hearts. A bar to heaven, a door to hell. Whoever named it, named it well. I want to say to you this morning, strong drink is public enemy number one. Devil's juice. I want to say to you this morning as I begin to close, if you've got a drink, if you just got to, man, I'll tell you the best way to do it. 
There's a man in here and thinks he's just got to drink. You've done made up your mind. You ain't going to repent. And God or nobody ain't going to change your mind. At least let me give you a suggestion on how to do it. First thing you do is start your own saloon. If you start your own saloon, you don't have to have a license. And you'll be the only customer. Give your wife $12, probably more than that by now, to buy a gallon of whiskey with. And then when she gets back, buy your drinks from her at 40 cents a shot, just like you would at the bar. And you just buy them all from her at 40 cents a shot. And after four days, you'll have, she will have $39.20 to go in the bank and $12 extra to buy another gallon. And if you keep this up in, at the end of 10 years, you will die of DTs and she will have $37,000. $750.40, enough to bury you, put you away, forget about you, and buy her and kids a nice home. If you got a drink, that's the best way to do it. I mean, some, brother, they're so stubborn and so mule-headed, they'll go right on and drink after what I'm preaching this morning. That's what's wrong with our generation. They ain't got no sense. They'll just go out and say, yeah, he told the truth. Pop. Listen, folks, when God sends you the message, He expects you to repent and do something about it. You're not a bunch of dummies in here that don't know the dangers of alcohol. You folks know what it'll do. It'll, it'll get you. It'll catch up with you. I want to say it's public enemy number one. I imagine there's probably some of you sitting in here saying, Oh, I don't see what he's so upset about. I don't think it's all that bad. But I wish you could read some of the other people's mind in here. For in the other people's mind in here, somebody saying, God help him. God give him grace. Preach it harder. God give him strength. I know what it done to my home. I know what it done to my husband. I know what it done to my wife. And brother, they realize what it can do. It's public enemy number one. That's why Evangeline Booth said liquor and beer had more blood, hung more crap, sold more homes, plunged more people to bankruptcy, armed more villains, uh, slain more children, snapped more wedding bands, defiled more innocence, blinded more eyes, twisted more limbs, dethroned more reason, more manhood, sold more womanhood, broke more hearts, blasted more lives, driven more to suicide, and put more in the graves than any other poison scourge that ever swept its death-dealing waves across this world. It's public enemy number one, folks. It'll doom you. It'll damn you. It'll destroy you. God wants to help you over that problem. And I'll close with these two final stories. You ever, you ever thought about dying drunk? Wouldn't it be a terrible way to die? Right down here between Charlotte and Salisbury is a wreck. Some men come up on the wreck and the boy jumped out and he said, there's a wreck and there's a man out there in the middle of the highway. And about that time, another man comes staggering out of the ditch. They said, there's a man laying in the highway. And he said, oh, he, he just had too much to drink. Don't pay no attention to him. He'll be all right when he sobers up. He just passed out. And they got him and took him in the ambulance and put him in the hospital. And come to find out, he passed out all right. He passed right out of this world. He's dead. He died drunk, folks! You know what the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6? Drunkards shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Said drunkards wouldn't go to heaven. Right. Said drunkards wouldn't go to heaven. Amen. You say, well, he's a Christian. No, they, no Christians quit drinking. Amen. That's right. Now, I believe that some Christians went back and back, slid and everything, but God straightened them out sooner or later. But I want to tell you one thing, folks. If you get right with the Lord, you quit drinking. Amen. 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 And brother, he died that way. Alexander the Great conquered the world before he was 40, 
but he died at 33 because he could not conquer himself. He died at the age of 33. He drunk himself to death. I've seen him in hospitals. I've been down here to Broughton to visit. Me and his families and wives asked me to go see him. I've seen him come in there and sit at a table and couldn't even hold a cup of coffee. I've seen him women and say, Danny, I don't know what makes them do it. I, 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 just, I, just, I just can't quit. Brother, when they could be out working, being strong, working a job, bringing a paycheck home every, every week and having a happy life, coming to church and enjoying the blessing of God, they're sitting down there in Broughton just a shake and can't even control themselves. Some of you little cute teenagers that get out and drink and think it's cute, they ought to take you down there and take you a tour through that place. That where you want to wind up? You say, oh, it makes me look big. Makes me look tough. Oh, it just makes you look like a dummy. That's what you are. I know some of you could strangle me right now. And probably some of you like to pat me on the back. And that's all the way, way to know when you're preaching the truth. If you're preaching the truth, brother, it cuts the crowd right down the middle. Some say, hey, man, go to God. Some say, I'm fighting mad. If I get up here and I give you a little speech every Sunday morning and everybody has the same reaction, well, that's pretty good. I didn't say much. That's right. Brother, when Jesus Christ opened up His mouth, people, ever, ever, they either said, we love you or we hate you. They stand with you or they stand against you. I want to say to you this morning, brother, that's our public enemy number one, but thank God, First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us. I want to say to you as I bring this message to a close this morning, I don't care how big of a problem you have with alcohol. I don't care how much you've been tempted to drink. God will forgive you this morning. Right now, right here in this service, God will forgive you. I want you to look. Look up in the future. There ain't no future in that kind of life. Look down the road five years. Look down the road ten years. You don't want to die drunk. You want to live a happy life. You want to be healthy. You want to see your kids grow up. You want to see your grandkids. You don't want to die drunk. You don't want to die drunk. You want to see God's blessings on you the rest of your life, don't you? i tell you what. You listening, everybody? The way to quit... Is quit. You know, some people say, well, I've cut down. I don't drink as much as I used to. You've not quit. What if I was going down the road? I was just getting in my car. And somebody said, Danny, you better quit going that way. And I say, well, I ain't going to quit going that way, but I'm going to slow down. I'm still going that way, ain't I? I ain't going as fast, but I'm still a-going. And some people, just because they don't get drunk about once every year, now, they think, well, boy, I'm really doing good. You ain't quit. You ain't quit till you've quit. That's just like smoking or anything else. You don't cut down, man. You quit. If I'm going this way, if I'm just going two miles an hour, I'm still going. The only way to quit is stop. Stop dead still and go the other way. Now, the only way for you to quit drinking this morning is not just say, well, I'm going to cut down. Right. You've got to quit. Amen. You say, hey, preacher, I've tried and I ain't quit. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. No, that's not the truth. God said He'd give you victory over sin. Amen. He said sin shall not have dominion over you. God is able. God is able to do a miracle for you and help you to quit anything you want to quit if you want to bad enough. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one talking, no one moving, no one leaving the building. Well, the mic's going to come and get us a song. Why don't you get serious this morning and let God be you? Why don't you? This message has been on our heart for over two months now. For about two months we've been 
wanting to preach this subject. God finally allowed. God chose you as the congregation to be here. I don't, I don't know what your problems may be. I have, I have, no idea. I just preach what the Lord laid on her heart, best of my ability. I believe God can help you this morning if you'll ask Him. And right there where you're sitting. While the piano plays softly, some invitational hymn. Right there where you're sitting, some man, some woman, boy or girl, different person when you leave this room. You say, well, I'm going to quit. No, you quit right now. If you got any, go home, pour it out. That's the only way you'll ever quit. That's, you've got to do it now. It's now. Now's the time, folks. Not next year, not next month. It'll be harder every day you wait. It'll be harder. While well, God's Spirit speaking to you, won't you just make that commitment right now? This morning as we give the invitation, you might want to come and pray. You might want to just come and say, Brother Danny, I've had a battle. It ain't nothing to be ashamed of, folks. Everybody in here has had a battle with something. It may not be alcohol, but it's something. You might want to come and say, I'm battling this morning. I want Jesus to give me the victory. You might want to come and just pray for someone dear to your heart. It's going to die and go to a drunkard's grave. Oh God, folks! We ain't got much time left. Oh, little kids have to see their daddy die drunk. I don't want nobody to have to say my daddy's an alcoholic, my mama's an alcoholic. They fuss and fight. Oh God, folks, God help us. I tell you, if God don't help them, they'll die and go to hell. You hear what I said? They'll die and go to hell. God don't help. I sure wouldn't want that to happen out of my family, would you? God's speaking to your heart this morning. You need to come to this altar. Why don't you get up out of your seat where you're sitting right now? Make your way down here. Tell it to Jesus. You say, Brother Danny, I can't do it. I ain't strong enough. Tell it to Jesus. He's strong enough. I tell you, if you'll ask Him and believe and mean it, Jesus will help you today. God speaking to your heart. Is the Lord dealing with you this morning? Is He? Is God speaking to you? How about it, friend? Amen. Amen, Brother Jesus. God speaking to your heart today. Is God dealing with your heart today? Hey, listen, folks. Did you know the curse of God's on everybody that sells it? The man that drives a truck and hauls it? The man that, that, that puts it and, and propagates it in any way? Is God speaking to your heart today? Is He? For you Christian ladies to come. Is He? You Christians continue to pray. This is the way we're just going to imitation, just like we are right here. If the Lord would lead. God's speaking to your heart today. Heads are still bad. Christians are praying. Some on this altar shedding tears over a loved one. I tell you, folks, don't you pay no attention to them stupid advertisements. All this thing that tell you, oh, it's just nice and it's refined and it's her society. Oh, it's all right if you just take a little drink, preacher. Every alcoholic that ever killed a little girl boy on the highway started out with one drink. Nobody started out an alcoholic. Just one drink. Then another, then another. You say, well, I can hold my liquor. It don't get a hold of me. You telling me you're stronger than Alexander the Great? A man that conquered the whole world? How about it? God speaking to you today. Is he? Is he? Young man, young lady? Mom or dad? Is Jesus speaking to your heart? If he is, why don't you come right now while we wait?
While we wait right now, we're going we're gonna to let these pray. Get whatever's on their heart settled this morning. Oh, God. I tell you, these folks on this altar right now that's got members of their family that's drunks. Oh, folks, get a burden for them. Help them to pray. Help them to pray. What if it is your dad? What if it is your mom? What if it is your brother or sister? Help them to pray, folks. If God don't do a miracle, some of them's going to a drunkard's grave. Devil's juice. It's evil. It's out of hell. It'll rob you. It'll destroy you. Ask God right now to help you. Say, dear God, by your grace, I'm going to leave that stuff alone. I know I'll be a better man. I'll be a better woman. I'll be a better girl. I'll be a better boy. I'll just leave it alone. God help me right now. And mean that thing. Mean it. Mean it with all your heart. God will hear you. Thank God He'll hear you. Bless His name. He'll hear you. Glory to God. You'll be able to stand up a trophy of grace and say, God delivered me. God help me. He'll help you. The deep truth has hit you this morning. You know what it's doing to you. You know what it's going to do to you. Ask God to help you get the victory right now. Ask God to help you get the victory. I tell you, you, you want a curse on your home? You keep devil's juice in the house and see if God's the same fire. You say, well, it relaxes my nerves. There's other things to relax your nerves. Namely, one is getting right with the Lord. That you more than anything. The Lord will help you if you'll let Him. Someone else, while these are praying, want to get up out of your seat and come to this altar. All right, while heads are still bowed and eyes are closed, just about 30 seconds we're going to go. How many of you in here this morning say, Brother Danny, I have seen what drinking will do to a person. It's affected my family in some way or somehow. Brother Danny, I saw what it can do. I wonder if you just slip up your hand. Take it right back down. God bless you. Nearly every hand in this building went out. You folks know what it'll do. All right, now, second, I want to ask before we, before we pray. Someone here would say, Brother Danny, I have a friend, I have a loved one who's being destroyed by a strong drink. And I'm going to trap them some way or another. I'm going to take them a, a copy of this tape or I'm going to, I'm going to pray for them more and I'm going to get them some tracts. I'm going to read them a Bible. I'm going to visit them. Danny, help me to pray to know what to do. Would you just slip up your hand? God bless you. God bless you. God, we'll be praying for those that you raised your hand for this morning. We'll be remembering them in prayer as we travel on the road and about this week. We'll be remembering those that you raised your hand in behalf of this morning. Folks, get down to business now. Time's running out. The Lord help us to do our part. Father, I thank you for these on the altar. I pray that you would bless them. I ask in Jesus' name, dear God, that you'd use them, that you'd move upon them. God, I pray that their need will be met. And Lord, I pray a special prayer for that one maybe this morning. Maybe here, Lord, I don't know if there is, but God, if there is someone here this morning that has a problem, Lord, with devil's juice, I pray, God, you'd help them to get to victory right now. Help them just turn it all over to you. Say, by your grace, Lord, I'm going to stand against it. And Lord, we'll praise you. And thank you for it. I pray, Lord, for these that lifted their hand in behalf of someone they know who's being destroyed by the, by the devil's juice. God, I pray that you'd move upon them. God, I pray for the people scattered all over this town and throughout this country. God, deal with their heart. Lord, help the American people to wake up and realize that wine's a mocker. They're being deceived, Lord. And we'll praise you and thank you. And then, Lord, I pray a special prayer about this beer and vote coming up March 31st in Marion, North Carolina. God, I pray you'd give the victory. 
God, we got too much of it already. We don't want no more. Don't need no more. I pray you'd give the victory. We don't want it in our grocery stores. God, you don't either. And I pray you'd send that victory. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen.